Okay, hello everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight we're continuing our study in this new topic, uh, Christian Creeds. And if you didn't see the first episode that we did a few days ago, uh, I hope you go back and watch that. Uh, we took a close look at the Apostles' Creed. Uh, before we get started tonight, though, let me ask our brother Eric and brother Stephen to introduce themselves. Hello, it's me again, the Homo, and the seven thunders. Today's thunder is believe in God's only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, and have eternal life. John 3.16, okay. Amen to that, and I definitely look forward to going into more detail about that in about 50 minutes' time. But anyway, everybody, my name is Stephen, known as Stephen Rivers TV here on YouTube, and uh, as usual, looking forward to another night of fellowship, studying, and preaching the gospel. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, uh, I sent the link to the webpage, uh, which is the source of our material for tonight. I sent that to Brother Stephen. Do you do you have that, Brother Eric? Could you want me to link it, put it on here, so you can access it or not? I don't have it. Yeah, go ahead and send it out to me. Okay, let me get that link to you right now. That way you can at least follow along. Control C. Okay, I'll put it right here in the chat room. Control V. All right, so you can pull that up. That way you'll be able to follow along more closely. Okay, uh, we talked about the Apostles' Creed last time. We read it, we analyzed it, but I think that I'd like to do a little bit more um, foundational uh, discussion here about creeds as a whole, and, we, and then we'll probably take a look at the Nicene Creed before we're, we're finished tonight. Uh, first of all, um, it says here, uh, Christianity has, through church history, produced a number of Christian creeds. Uh, I've been surprised at how many there actually are. Uh, there are some that are quite well known, and then it seems like every denomination has established their own creed. And many of them use one of these big creeds, like the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene's Creed. But... Um, and they use them in varying varying ways. I found too. Uh, some of them use it as just something they uh, they uh, have published as that they believe. Others use it in part reciting in as part of their liturgy, where the the uh, uh, the congregation recites it together. Sometimes they use it as a part of a baptis baptismal uh, ceremony. Uh, sometimes they do it as a question and answer. They ask, uh, "Do you believe this?" And they'll read the statement, and then someone, is, the people, the congregation responds, "Yes, we believe." Uh, so they they use the Apostles' Creed uh, in that way. A lot of different denominations, and I, I said last time, I find the Apostles' Creed very very lacking in a lot of things. I think are important. We'll go into more detail on all that as we go along. But it also says here, uh, Christianity has, through cr church history, produced a number of Christian creeds, confessions, and statements of faith. And a confession and a statement of faith is basically, these are almost interchangeable, I guess, for creeds. Uh, I'm going to read now, since uh, I, I've mentioned my creed or my statement of faith that I've written, uh, I found that the creeds that I've looked at uh, I haven't been satisfied with them, so I decided to write my own creed. Now, creeds are not um, meant to uh, list everything you believe about every doctrinal question, every theological subject. Uh, they're 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 intended to cover the most basic and essential things. So uh, the the creed that uh, let me see, did I post it there? I thought I posted it, but uh, let me go find it real quick here. Okay, it says, uh, Statement of Faith. I am a Christian 
Now what I've done here also, so you might note, is that the word Christian, and I'm, I'm pronouncing it Christian rather than Christian, uh, because I want the name of Christ uh, to be emphasized. So rather than referring to myself as a Christian, I say I am a Christian, you know, one who relies entirely on Jesus Christ for salvation and eternal life. Uh, Jesus is the object of my faith. So in other words, my salvation is based upon uh, tr trusting Jesus and, and I'm relying completely on him rather than anything of my own. And Jesus, this person, Jesus, is the object of my faith. Uh, and that is important because, as I've said numerous times, a lot of people believe various creeds and they believe various doctrines are true. They, they, oh, they say, yeah, historically it's correct. That really happened. I believe it's true. And yet they've never made Jesus the object of their faith. They never are saying that the reason I'm going to go, go to heaven is one thing. Jesus is my Savior. Uh, so I am emphasizing that Jesus is the object of my faith. It says I am not a Calvinist. Calvinism attacks the character and nature of God. I added this recently because uh, uh, I don't. I believe Calvinists believe in a different God, and therefore they're not Christians. Uh, I'm not Arminian because Arminianism attacks the sufficiency of the finished work of Christ on the cross. Uh, so because Arminians do not believe that. Uh, when you believe in Jesus that you're eternally saved. They believe that uh, you could lose your salvation if you lose your faith or uh, fall into uh, uh, sin. The, the, it says, then I say the truth is we, we have a free will that counteracts uh, uh, the Calvinist uh, uh, belief that man has no free will. It says the truth is we have a free will, the ability to believe or reject the free gift of salvation and once we have believed, then our salvation is irrevocable by God or by us. So this tells us that you're free to put your faith in Jesus or not. Everybody is free to do it. God does not uh, make some people believe and forbid and not allow others to believe, as, as Calvinism teaches. And it says that once we, once we believed, that then we end up... My phone's ringing. I should have unplugged it, but uh, that's all right. Um, I'll try to ignore it. Okay. All right. I right, just answer and hung up. Uh, it says, um, um, once we believe, our salvation is irrevocable by God or by us. So, in other words, God cannot revoke revoke it because He cannot break His promise. We cannot revoke it uh, because uh, we're um, secured. Our, it's not based on our continued faith. It's based upon the continued faithfulness of our Savior. And Jesus said that if, if we have no faith, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Then here we get into the deity of Christ question. It says, Jesus Christ is the eternal God, the only Savior, and the sole source of eternal life. So Jesus Christ is eternal God is important because it, it, this is one of the... Um, essential uh, characteristics or um, components of God. You've got to be eternal. Uh, and this is something we'll look at in these creeds because that was why the creeds, many of these creeds were written to address this question. So I say Jesus is the eternal God, the only Savior, the sole source of eternal life. And then Jesus is the eternal God manifest in the flesh as the Son of God. So he's not only eternal God, but he became a man in Jesus and he's called the Son of God. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid for the sins of the whole world. So all the sins of everybody are paid for. Uh, Jesus, when Jesus rose from the dead, he proved he has power over life and death. Uh, he's the sole source of life everlasting. Jesus offers salvation and eternal life as a free gift to everyone. The word, word everyone is capitalized because that's to address the problem the Calvinists have in saying that it's it's only offered to the elect, to a certain few people. But everyone uh, uh, is uh, included. This salvation is for everyone. Anyone can do it, can believe in it. We receive the gift of eternal life through faith alone in Christ alone. Uh, and then this next statement is connected. No works are required to get saved, to stay saved, or to prove one's salvation. So this, this 
final statements here are all about salvation and the fact that we're saved because of our faith in Jesus, not because of any works we do. We don't have to do any works to, to achieve salvation. We don't do any works to keep our salvation. We don't have to do any works to prove that we're truly saved. And then finally, our salvation is eternally secure. Uh, we cannot lose it for any reason. The word any is capitalized because there's no reason at all. There's no possible way that our salvation can be lost. We, we can't even give it back if we change our mind and say we don't want to be Christians anymore. We're stuck with it whether we like it or not once we believe in Jesus. So that's the statement of faith that I wrote and the reason for all those things I've tried to explain as I went along there. But to me, that that statement of faith or that creed covers what is really, really essential. And I'm finding that some parts of these things are greatly neglected in some of the classic Christian creeds that we will be discussing. So let me get a quick response to that before we go on. That was very wonderful, Brother Luke. And uh, I also did my own creed. And uh, it's right here. It says, believe. What does it say? Can you read that? Believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and love one another. But now, back to your creed, Brother Luke. That was very intriguing. Uh, you packed so much in that first five minutes of ten minutes of uh, the show that I was just uh, amazed. Okay. Okay, well, looking at, you know, like this creed, you know, in comparison to like some of the ancient creeds, the only one we've covered so far is the Apostles' Creed, which I'm not going to read it, but I'm just looking at it here. It was definitely very vague, like on, like sometimes the divinity of, you know, Jesus, or even, you know, how salvation happens, or in, you know, the security that we have in salvation. I, I do not correctly remember you know, that creed covering all that stuff, because it really left that out. And, I mean, I haven't looked at, you know, too many of the other creeds besides a little bit of the Nicene Creed. And but then again, like, as you said, though, a lot of these creeds, from what I've heard, you know, are very vague in certain areas. But looking at the, um, the creed, you know, that we're going by here on this channel, it's very, you know, clear about, you know, there's no works, you know, required to be saved of course, about our eternal security, about Jesus being the eternal God, and of course also about things that attack, you know, the character of God, you know, Calvinism, or, you know, Arminism, and the sufficiency of God. And it points out that we, you know, rely completely, and it's only on Jesus for our salvation, where, you know, the other creed that we did, did not. So that's the big thing about a, about a creed is you should definitely be big on the essentials. Like especially, you know, salvation, eternal security, you know, how to be saved, and of course in Jesus himself. And, you know, some of these early ones aren't, but I know if I keep talking, we're not going to get to that, so I'll just stop here. Okay, all right, very good. So to me, I, the reason I wanted to do that was not to try to... Uh, it, it wasn't whether you believe this or not, it's not self-serving to try to show, well, look at my creed. My creed's better than these other creeds. I, I want people to understand that not only does this uh, statement of faith that I publish, uh, does it cover the what I believe are really the essentials of Christianity, uh, but you can see the contrast as we go through some of these other creeds that uh, and you can see why I, I think that they are they're, from what I've seen they're all greatly lacking. Uh, now let's be, let's go on then. Uh, looking at these creeds, um, uh, we're going to click on now. Can you see where it says primary creeds? If you can see that, click on it. Okay. Uh, do you? Let me ask you. Okay. Did you both find that? Got it. Not yet. Be there in a second. 
Should you just take a second? Are you lost? Uh, I'm on a um, slightly different thing. I'm opening up my email, so I'll be there in about a minute or two, but just keep going. I'll catch up in a second. All right. Uh, so now as we go down here, you can see these, uh, you scroll down a little bit, you see the chart that has these creeds listed. And uh, it says the creed, the date it was written, who is who is it's accepted by, uh, the original name, and then some notes. Um, so if if we look at the next creed, uh, the Creed of Nicaea, uh, it's 325 A.D. is when it was written, and then it says under notes, it's the product of the first ecumenical council in Nicaea, which tried to solve the Arian, the Arian controversy. So we're going to click on first ecumenical council. Brother Eric, are you did, were you able to do that? Okay. And now from here, uh, I've, talked, I've talked about this quite a bit, so now we're going to uh, see uh, this why the Nation Council happened, and uh, just as, I'll just mention it very briefly here. It says, uh, uh, the first Council of Nicaea was a council of Christian bishops convened in Nicaea in Bithynia by the Roman Emperor Constantine in 325 A.D., the first ec ecumenical council, uh, and the reason it's called ecumenical is that just means worldwide. That means that they've had a lot of councils throughout history, but they were a lot of them were local. But this is worldwide. It's the first time Christian representatives from all the world got together under the order of uh, Emperor Constantine, and and uh, he said we need. I want to get all the leaders together. We got to work this out about this deity of Christ question. And so it says, this first ecumenical council was the first effort to attain consensus in the church through an assembly representing all of Christendom. It was presided over by Hosius of Corduba, a bishop from the West. Its main accomplishments were settlement of the Christological issue of the nature of the Son of God and his relationship to God the Father. Okay, and then, uh, and then it resulted in this Creed of Nicaea. So... Uh, now I'm going to click back, go backwards where we were, and now we're back on these creeds. And we can read the Creed of Nicaea. Uh, click on that, Creed, uh, Nicaea, the Creed of Nicaea. Uh, Brother Eric, are you still with me? You've been able to click on the right spots? Okay. All right. But first, before I read the Creed of Nicaea and we discuss it, I want your reaction to just that introductory to the creed, if that's news to you. It really shouldn't be because we've also got this study on church history, and we've been talking about a lot of these things there too. Yes, it's very interesting, and they had specific purposes and specific areas that they wanted to address. And we're, I was wondering if, uh, Stephen, have you developed your creed yet? Um, I did write a tract on the one video that I did do about salvation, but um, yeah, just to answer that question, I do have a tract. Well, I, do you think that a tract is uh, for the same purpose as a creed? Are they interchangeable terms? Actually, no, they're not. So, But I could still write a creed, and it wouldn't take me but like five minutes to, or ten minutes to write one. But... Um, I don't, let me stop and hold big sense, you know, you know, Brother Eric, how he likes to ask these questions, opening up all kinds of boxes of worms. Yeah, so we can answer this later on. No, I'm addressing it now. And that okay. is that uh, I, I do want to encourage every person watching this to, uh, to write a statement of faith. I, the first thing I do when I encounter a new person or I'm looking at some church or organization, the first thing I do is start searching for their statement of faith. Um, most, uh, I mean, churches, they all, they all have a creed or a statement of faith or articles of faith. And, and even on YouTube, I think everybody who has a YouTube channel that has some kind of Christian ministry, I think it's really our duty to publish our core doctrines, our statement of faith. So, um, I've had mine on my channel and all my videos for many years now, and uh, I've had to modify it. Uh, I recently modified it, uh, adding the statements I put there about Calvinism and Arminianism because it's become such a part of a discussion on YouTube. 
Um, so I hope you will do that, uh, Stephen, and every, everybody who's watching. But now, based on the introduction that I just read, talking about why there is a Nicene Creed and this ecumenical council, do you have any response to that? Go ahead, Stephen. I believe it's still your turn. All right. Well, I mean, I'm not really, you know, 100 percent, you know, surprised by what's going on, because I mean, I remember in early church history we were already talking about the Roman government getting involved with what was going on. With I remember it was I believe the the person's name I believe was Paul. I don't remember his last name, but let's see. This one we're looking at consensus throughout. You know, this is ecumenical. So I'm thinking, you know, it's the you said it was like the whole world, but you know, the Roman Empire was huge, you know, in this area. So definitely getting, you know, the empire and even the area out of it. Let's see, it says that we're gonna be looking at the issue of, you know, the Son of God and his relationship to God the Father. I remember us covering this in the um, Apostles' Creed. I don't have it up there, but I think we were looking that it was lacking in that area. So this is going to be, you know, addressing probably the problems in that. Although, like, once I get it up, we'll have to look about what it says about statement of faith, but we'll get to there. Yeah. Okay. So the important thing for people to want to understand now, if you haven't seen the series, we've done already 13 hours study of early church history. That's an ongoing study. Uh, I think we talked about that last night, but. Uh, I hope you will watch that, but uh, you, you'll learn that the the first couple of centuries of church history, uh, they they were concerned about people teaching a variety of things about Christianity. The word they they wanted unity, they wanted people teaching the same thing, uh, and 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 one of the main issues of debate and discussion and disagreement was this who is Jesus and you had all kinds of extreme viewpoints on this some of them said he's only a man and, and that he became holy because he lived a perfect life and he attained some level of godliness and other people say no he's only God he wasn't even a man because being a material uh, materialism is evil the material world is evil and, and then you had all kinds of degrees in between uh, and so all of these different factions were teaching different things and they, they came to a point where they said we need to get together and discuss this and agree. Uh, so that's why this Council of Nicaea was called. Who is this Jesus, this Son of God and the Father, God the Father, God the Son? For really several hundred years they didn't really even include the Holy Spirit in the discussion. Uh, they, they, they didn't. And later on, they will do the same thing that we're that they are doing here at the Council of Nicaea, trying to define the relationship between the Father and the Son. And then later on, they're going to fi finally get around to asking, well, how does the Holy Spirit fit into all of this? But for now, the issue is, uh, how do we explain G the Father and the Son? Okay, so now I'll read the Nicene Creed. Uh, and then you can, uh, let me see if I can find it here, uh, scroll down far enough, English translations, English versions of the Nicene Creed, go down to the English translations, okay, there it is, uh, now, let me ask if uh, you guys were able to find that, do you have that in front of you now? I'm looking at the words English translations in front of me right now. Click on that and then scroll down until you find the English translation. If you don't find it, then you just have to listen. Okay. Now I'm going to. The creeds almost always start off with with the phrase "I believe" or "We believe." So if it's "I believe," it's a person saying, "This is what I believe," and and you're agreeing that you will believe with this in this creed, and therefore you're accepted as what is accepted to be a Christian. Uh, okay, it says, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all that is seen and unseen. 
uh, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, from God, from God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, and of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. Um, now, I'll stop there so we can... Uh, we can discuss what, what's uh, read so far. Anything in there uh, stand out is f to you? Well, I'm uh, following along in the English translation of the Armenian version, and I don't think that was the same one that you were reading. Hmm. Well, hold on. Let me get a little bit further back. But um, it says here, you know, I feel like it's slightly more detailed than the Apostles' Creed because the Apostles' one was pretty vague, you know, in this area. Like it's saying, yeah. yeah he, I, I just posted the uh, the new the new one here. No, oh, I thought I did. Oh, it didn't go. Let me see if I can. Oh, that's not what I wanted. I posted the link to it, not the creed. Uh, oh yeah. So is that where you are? The link. I'm going there right now. Okay, that way you get the same creed that I'm reading. Okay, same term, exact words. All right, brother Steve. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Well, I was saying it was a, looked like it's a, in a little bit more detail than what the Apostles' Creed was. One thing I say that I guess stands out to me is how it says we believe in one God. Then it says we believe in one Lord. You know, Jesus Christ. I just kind of notice how it says like both of those things. How it says we believe in one God, then it says we believe in one Lord. And then it says you know that Jesus is the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. I cannot remember off the top of the head the um, detail level that the Apostles' Creed went into. So, although here it says eternally begotten of the Father, so it could be saying that. Same begotten. Oh wait, no, it does say not made. So I guess that would imply that he was not, you know, just like a creation of God. So I guess that stands out. And it says of unwanted being with the Father. So I guess, mm, I guess I'm looking for, you know, always being there eternally. But it's just worded a little bit different. But I think the thing that definitely stood out to me was just how it says we believe in one God. Then it says we believe in one Lord. All right, brother Eric. Does anything stand out to you before I go break this down a little more on on this uh, first section? What really stood out to me, brother Luke and Stephen, brother Stephen, was when you were reading it in the previous uh, comments, and I was following along in the Armenian. It appeared that the Armenian was very more detailed and eloquent. You might want to look into that. Okay. Uh, all right, let me go through this uh, a little more slowly. It says, we believe in one God. So the key, one of the main things is that the defense of monotheism. Uh, this was an argument because uh, some people believe that um, if you have the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, then you have polytheism, not monotheism. So right off the bat, they say we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, all that is seen, uh, all that is seen and unseen. So uh, anybody would agree with this. I mean, anybody uh, at that time, uh, in this debate, uh, that was going on, the reason they wrote this this creed here, they're trying to write things in a way that it clarifies it and some people will be eliminated. People who were, some of these things or statements are specifically written to address some false teachings or teachings that they considered to be false, so they had to clarify it. But this first part, I don't think anybody is going to disagree with. We believe in one God, the Father, the, uh, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. So no one is going to, no faction is going to disagree with that. Then it says, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, 
eternally begotten of the Father. Now this line here was uh, was there uh, because uh, uh, some faction said no, he's not eternal at all. And but but then this is this is not um, even going to be enough for some to settle it because there's an argument when you say eternally begotten uh, that means that well if he's begotten that means the son had a beginning you see some people said no the the father is eternal he doesn't have a beginning but the son began at his begetting and and, and therefore he is not eternal uh, but they put in here eternally begotten to try to say he's he's begotten and yet he's eternally begotten so he's always been begotten and but that's not going to satisfy some people now here is the statement that you were looking for when it talks about we believe in one Lord but well is he is he Lord is that something different than God and it says God from God so it's referring to Jesus as, as God from God light from light true God from true God begotten not made now this is to to address the the, the heresy that you no know, Jesus was made he did have a beginning he's a creature so they put that in there to clarify that no you've got to agree that Jesus is not made uh, and then of one being with the Father uh, of one being with the Father now through him all things were made for us and for our salvation he came down from heaven now when it says for us and for our salvation he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit he became in oh, let me stop there at for us and for our salvation he came down from heaven now, let me ask you just to respond to anything I said up to that point so uh, they're really being specific here aren't they and uh, they still seem to have missed a few th important items, even though they're getting pretty specific. What do you think, Stephen? Well, I mean, I'd say it's more specific than, you know, the Apostles' Creed that we first had. But, um, yeah, it's definitely addressing, you know, some of those, you know, questions, like how we believe in one God. But then, of course, as Luke said, it can be questionable, I guess, when you're talking about how it says we believe in, you know, you know, one Lord. And of course, they talk about, you know, the begotten part. But of course, now to respond to that um, last comment, how it says, for us, you know, and for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, one thing, it, well, it doesn't really explain, I guess, why we need salvation, like in this thing, you know, talking about how we are, you know, sinners. Well, I mean, I guess these people may have known that, but. Still, it could have gone. It could go into more more details about you know why we might need salvation. But yeah, it'll say more stuff about that later. But that's what I have to say as of right now. Well, it wasn't really necessary to say why we need salvation because nobody was disputing that uh, man was a, a, a sinner and that. Uh, there was this question uh, going on also about the uh, the nature of man, and that's why they argued that Jesus didn't have a human nature, because if he had a human nature, that would mean that uh, he was a, a sinner, because we're born with a sinful human nature. So that became part of the debate too. Uh, so the, the idea that, hey, we're all sinners and we, that's why we need the Savior, they didn't need to address that. That was agreed upon already. The creed is, is, is there. Everything in this creed is really designed to address any things that has been argued and been disputed for a couple hundred years. Um, but it says he came down from, from heaven for our salvation. Now, certainly for our salvation, don't we need to know a lot more than he came down from heaven for our salvation? So far, that's all we have. Let me continue reading. And it says, uh, uh, By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. Okay, uh, in this case, uh, talking about the Virgin Mary, 
and uh, the Holy Spirit, and, and that's how he was made into a man. Uh, that is something that, um, well, I guess they felt that that was absolutely important to understand. Uh, the question is, is he God and is he man? Uh, how was he born? Was he born in sin? Because some people thought that um, you're, every, we inherit sin when, through birth because every, even sexual acts, intercourse, even within a marriage, is a sin. So you're brought into the world um, through sin. He was conceived in sin in his mother's womb, as, as uh, David said. Uh, so, uh, I don't know, for me, you notice I didn't put anything about the Virgin Mary and the Virgin Birth in my creed. Now some people, because I don't think this is something that's essential that a person has to understand and agree to. Uh, I believe that he was conceived not by uh, normal means. I believe that Mary was a virgin. I, I, I believe that the Holy Spirit uh, came on Mary. How it, how God exactly did it, I can't try to attempt to explain. Um, I think that it was probably uh, necessary because in Genesis it says that uh, uh, it would be the seed of a woman. Would Satan would bruise his heel and he would crush his head. The seed of a woman. And we know that a woman doesn't have a seed, does she? The 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 the, the man's uh, contribution to, into uh, reproduction is referred to as the seed. It says that uh, one in the Old Testament, the man spilled his seed on the ground. So when we hear the word seed in the Bible, we think this that's the man's contribution. The woman is not contributing a seed. Uh, so it was the seed of a woman because there was no man. There was no man contributing to this birth. It was the Holy Spirit. So, I mean, obviously I believe in the the, uh, the virgin birth, but I don't put it in my creed because I don't think a person has to necessarily understand that or agree to it in order to be a Christian. Let me get your response to that. Well, uh, it appears to me that there's a mystery there, Brother Luke. The mystery of the virgin womb and the virgin tomb. Okay, but that's something that we can all ponder on late at night when we're pondering on such things. What do you think, Stephen? Well, when it comes to, you know, the birth, you know, of the Virgin Mary, of course, being born of the Holy Spirit, I mean, that's definitely very important, you know, to show, like, you know, how he came, you know, into this world to show that, you know, he was definitely, you know, born of God. But when it comes to, you know, like the creeds, I mean, you don't necessarily have to understand that, you know, to believe and trust in Jesus, you know, to be saved. Because, I mean, you know, to be saved, you're trusting that, you know, Jesus, you know, paid it all for you, you know, when he died on the cross, you know, that he covered all your sins, and it's not, you know, by your righteousness, but by, you know, what it's what he done. And, of course, that you're eternally secure in him. And, well, I mean, we know that he was eternal, that he was, you know, in the flesh. But I know, like, a lot of the times, you know, when most of us even explain, like, our, um, when we're explaining the gospel, we don't really mention the Virgin Mary. So, I mean, you don't really have to know much about, you know, her. But, yeah. Okay, my, my theory about why this is in there is that we, we know that the Roman Catholicism, which was evolving about this time. It finally didn't really become an official Roman Catholic religion. Uh, it became the official religion of Rome in, in uh, uh, I think, around 370. Uh, uh, and then in, in about 590 is when they got their first official pope. But even now, in the beginning, at 325 AD, uh, and for 200 years, before that, this debate has been going on about Jesus and who he is, but they've also started to elevate and emphasize Mary. 
And it eventually came to the point where with Roman Catholicism, they've got Mary as what they call a co-redemptress. In other words, she's co-savior. Uh, and uh, it's really become what is, is Mariolatry, the idolatry and the worshiping of Mary. And that, that's the point it, it has reached. And I think that we see the beginnings of it here by inserting this into the creed. Uh, not that it's not a fact, but to elevate it to that importance along with these other things, uh, uh, you can see the beginnings of it, I think, there. Uh, any reaction before I move on and move forward? Uh, it's hard to react to that because uh, there's so many dear sweet grannies all over the world praying to the Virgin Mary right now and uh, they're just the sweetest old ladies you would ever uh, meet. What, do you, what would you say to them, uh, Stephen? Well, I've got to be honest. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, you know, I am the life and there's no other way to come to the Father but by, you know, Jesus. I mean, he said it, you know, pretty straight up. You really can't be any more upfront than that. And, you know, having Mary as a co-savior is a big problem with that because, you know, Mary didn't die on the cross for our sins. You know, Jesus did. You know, Jesus is the Son of God, and it's only through him, you know, that all of us are saved. So, you know, putting importance, you know, on, you know, the Virgin Mary and saying that she's co-savior, it's just, it's a big formula for disaster. People are believing on, you know, her too because, it's only by faith alone and Christ alone. So it's just really leading people to just stumble. I mean, it can you know, just cost people their eternity, too. All right. Well, I don't want to get sidetracked. I've got a ten, about 10 hours of teaching against Roman Catholicism. You can see it on my playlist, uh, Roman Catholicism Debunked. And you can see the origins, the history, and the doc, false doctrines of Roman Catholicism if you go to my... Uh, YouTube channel, but that's not the purpose of tonight's discussion, so let me move forward into this creed here. It says, um, it says, um, for our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, uh, and on the third day he rose again according to scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. So let me get your reaction to that portion. Okay. Now we're getting into the heart of the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Wouldn't that be considered the heart of the gospel? What do you think, Stephen? Uh, okay, well, looking at, you know, this part of it, of course it says, for our sake, they're again, you know, bringing up, you know, Pilate, which I don't think is, you don't necessarily need to mention him, in my opinion, but, of course, it is important to mention, you know, the, cru the crucifixion that he died, you know, was buried and rose again, you know, in accordance with the scriptures, and it says, wait, I don't remember where exactly we stopped, oh, wait, no, we went to that seat at the right hand of the Father. Because we know that he did do that. We know that he is seated at the right hand of the Father, you know, in accordance with the scriptures. But um, uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, of course, the I feel like, you know, Pilate doesn't need to be mentioned. But um, one thing I'm just going to notice, you know, looking ahead is it's not, you know what, we'll mention that after this. All right. Uh, so... When you say we're getting to the heart of the gospel, um, these creeds con contain uh, some facts about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, a statement saying, uh, it says, for our sake he was crucified and died on the third day, he was raised. Um, and that's uh, an agreement with Paul said, what Paul said is the gospel that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Uh, he was buried and on the third day raised from the dead according to the scriptures. So in that way, it's an agreement with what uh, Paul says, this is the gospel that I taught you. Um, but then we get into the, the problem of that I've mentioned probably a hundred times over the years now, is that um, I can give you 1.2 billion people that make mental assent to the 
the truth of that statement, and yet, do you think they're saved? If a person says, uh, yes, I believe that's true. Jesus died on the cross. He was buried. He, I don't know, even, even according to uh, the, what's written in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Jesus, it says, Jesus died for our sins. He was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. Uh, I believe that's true. Uh, and then you ask them, um, okay, um, my question now is, do you think you're going to go to heaven uh, and why? And then they answer you, well, I'm not sure I'm going to go to heaven. I hope I am. Um, I'm doing the best I can. I am very religious. I, I got water baptized when I was an infant. And I've, I've gone to catechism. And I've, gone, I've gone to confession and communion and confirmation. And I, I attend church all the time. I'm, I'm hoping that I've done enough and I can get to go to heaven. You see, what is the problem with that person as I, that I just described there? Even though they said, I believe Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and raised from the dead. Do you see any problem with their, their, uh, their answer? Yes, because they're looking at their own works. They're looking at like what they've done and not you know, just actually trusting in what Jesus did for them. I mean, they say they believe he did that, but they're not actually thinking that's sufficient enough. They're still looking at what they've done. Very good. Also, I'd like to uh, uh, explain that uh, according to scriptures is a legal term where all the fine print is stored, which is all of scriptures. Okay, back to you. Okay, let, and let's look at a distinction in this in the statement of faith that I read in the beginning. It says, I am a Christian, one who relies entirely on Jesus Christ for salvation and eternal life. Jesus is the object of my faith. And that's the distinction between Christianity and, and what we're seeing here. We're not seeing in this creed the, 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 the plea to people, put your faith in Jesus and he will get you into heaven. Uh, it's not there at all. Believe in this person. Trust this person, and, and he promises you eternal life, and he guarantees it if you'll trust him. He, this is what he did for you. But instead, they don't mention that your your faith must be in this person, and that and that that's what's required. Instead, they they tell you facts about what happened, but therefore the end result is. The person never puts their faith in these facts in this person. They still have their faith in their own personal merit as the, as the problem. Now let me move forward here. Uh, uh, he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. Uh, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord will, the, the Lord the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, uh, with the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. Uh, he has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic apostolic church. Uh, I know the Lutherans, went, or there's a group that uses this, and when I was comparing their versions of this creed, it says we believe in one uh, holy Christian in apostolic church instead of Catholic, which would be better. Uh, but it says, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Now, so here's the problem is they're teaching that bapt you get baptized for the forgiveness of sins. And therefore, what, what that leads to is they conclude that you get when you get baptized as an infant or later on as an adult if you get baptized, uh, that your sins up to that point are forgiven, but all your future sins must be dealt with and you're responsible for that and that's why you've got to do confessions and and Eucharist and all these other things that they started introducing for because the sins of your whole life are not paid for on the cross only the sins that were bef up until your up until your baptism that's why Constantine would not get baptized and, t and others would not get baptized until they're about to die uh, it says we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Okay, so uh, that last portion there, uh, what's your reaction to all that? Well, 
it looks like they're falling short on a few items there, doesn't it? Steven, I would, uh, what's yeah. going on here? Well, I was about to start talking, but um, I would definitely agree. Because it doesn't talk about you having faith in Jesus and about that being, you know, sufficient. Of course, nor does it talk about, you know, eternal security, you know, here. So it's not talking about faith alone and Christ alone. I mean, it does say that, you know, for our salvation, he came and died and was buried and rose again. But it's not talking about, you know, I guess how to receive the gift, you know, of salvation. And, of course, it says he will come to judge living and the dead. Of course, it's not saying, what, you know, what he's judging them against. And, of course, it says the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. And, you know, it doesn't talk about him, I guess, being, the, you know, the comforter. You know, or you know, guiding you into all truth. It doesn't really seem like it mentions that. But um, looking at most of the stuff, I could, there's the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. I'm not going to talk too much about that. And it says, oh yeah, the baptism is a huge problem because it can definitely cause you to believe, you know, in the baptism and not in Jesus. And of course, it says for the forgiveness. Oh yeah, but that's yeah. The problem is it's saying you know, baptism for the forgiveness of sins and not believing in Jesus. So that's what I have a big problem with. Yeah, there's a lot of I have a lot of issues with this, and uh, I w but I will tell you there's a few things that I know why they put it in here because these were to address. Remember, why was the Council of Nicaea called? Because there were disagreements, and they called them all, everybody together to try to get some agreement and find uh, some area where they could agree, and then the people outside of that area. Would be labeled heretics, and uh, uh, so some of the things that were being uh, that they thought was heresy, they actually put in the creed to address those problems. Some of these we've mentioned, but right here is another one. It says, "It says we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the Giver of Life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son." So there are, there was an argument that the Holy Spirit only proceeded from the Father, but not the Son. And, uh, and then the other faction said, no, the Holy Spirit proceeds out of both the Father and the Son. And so they ended up agreeing here that, putting in the creed, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified, so therefore they're, lab they're addressing the Holy Spirit in, as uh, God to be worshipped and glorified. Uh, he has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. The word Catholic is, uh, I think we should absolutely not associate ourselves with that word, even though at that time it doesn't refer to Roman Catholicism as we know it today, even though even in this creed I can see the beginnings of some of these Roman Catholic errors entering in. Uh, but uh, I would say I, I believe in one holy Christian church. <laughs> you know, not one holy Catholic apostolic church, because the the Catholic and the apostolic. The problem with that is that uh, you you must believe in what they ended up calling apostolic succession. That um, rather than believing in in the Bible as we read it, we have to go to the generations of church fathers that came after the apostles. The apostolic succession of what everything that they taught is what we have to accept. And what I felt is that, I feel is that, look at the disagreements that were the necessity of this council being called, because all, there were so many factions of disagreement, they couldn't agree. So why should I just trust uh, all these, these people that we refer to as church fathers, when the church fathers are all disagreeing and they have, they have to have a council and write a creed to try to settle it all. Uh, so no, rather than trusting the Catholic Church or the Apostolic Church, uh, I choose to trust this instead. Uh, and then it says, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. I, I do too. Okay, uh, any uh, final remarks on this before we, uh, we finish for the night? Um, we've gone very in-depth and really looked at it with the microscope and there was some great comments from Stephen. Ah, uh, Stephen, good job. And Brother Luke, of course, it was amazing. Okay, back to you. 
Well, I mean, we look at this, and compared to the Apostles' Creed, you know, it's got a little bit more material in it than the Apostles' Creed does, but it's still lacking in a lot of areas, especially when it comes to, you know, how to actually get saved, you know, to trust, you know, faith alone and Christ alone. And, of course, just having a big problem with, you know, inserting, you know, baptism, you know, as, you know, for the forgiveness of sins and not just faith alone. And, of course, you know, like adding some things like the Virgin Mary and Pontius Pilate to some unnecessary, I guess, ads, and then, you know, a lot of just omissions, too. But then again, I know we're going to apparently see a lot of this in our future creeds, too. So what we see, the difference between the Apostles' Creed that we did the, in the first study, and then here, the, the, the first Nicene Creed, uh, the, the Nicene Creed goes into much greater de detail explaining the, the Godhead, the deity of Christ and the Holy Spirit, and the relationship, it's much more thorough. Uh, they both are greatly lacking in, in teaching about salvation and even erroneous uh, false teachings about salvation in these creeds. Next time, so this was 325 AD, the first ecumenical council in Nicaea, and, and the, the next time we study the creed, uh, we'll go to 381 AD, the second ecumenical council, and they, they get together again in Nicaea to, uh, I know in, in Constantinople, they get together again to refine this because between 325 AD and 381 AD, there's still some what they would consider heres heretical views going around, and there's a necessity for them to come together again to add to this creed and, and further define things. And so that's what we'll look at ne next time is the, the uh, second nice. I see the the uh, the redo the uh, the revision of the Nicene Creed in Constantinople. Um, I'm going to read my statement of faith one time again, so if everybody can get the difference. After now that we've looked at the Nicene Creed, I'll read this again, and then I'll ask Brother Stephen to, uh, based upon this statement of faith of mine, explain to you in more detail what it what that means in terms of if you want to be saved. Uh, I am a Christian, one who relies entirely on Jesus Christ for salvation and eternal life. Jesus is the object of my faith. I'm not a Calvinist. Calvinism attacks the character and nature of God. I'm not Arminian. Arminianism attacks the sufficiency of the finished work of Christ on the cross. The truth is, we have a free will the ability to believe or reject the free gift of salvation, and once we have believed, then our salvation is irrevocable by God or by us. Jesus Christ is the eternal God, the only Savior, and the sole source of eternal life. Jesus is the eternal God manifest in the flesh as the Son of God. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid for the sins of the whole world. When Jesus rose from the dead, he proved he has power over life and death. Jesus offers salvation and eternal life as a free gift to everyone. We receive the gift of eternal life through faith alone, in Christ alone. No works are required to get saved, to stay saved, or to prove one's salvation. Our salvation is eternally secure. We cannot lose it for any reason. All right, brother. Uh, Brother Stephen, I'll let you take it from here. All right, and this is my favorite part of, you know, every night, is being able to explain, you know, the very simple gospel of Jesus Christ. So for everybody listening, you know, this is like how to get to heaven. All right, and so I'll start off by reading my favorite verse, which is the gospel in a nutshell, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, we as men, we're sinners, and there's nothing we can do about it. No matter how good we may try to be, or no matter how many good works, or no matter what religion you join, it won't be good enough. Of course, there's a big difference between religion, because you know religion likes to talk about what you have to do to get to God. You know, not about what has God done for you. But it clearly states in Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, not even one. 
it says it pretty clear. And as it also says, you know, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know, that's in all of our case. And of course, as it says, for all have sinned, it says in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. All of us deserve death. And this isn't just talking about normal death. All men will die, you know, the first death. You know, you can't escape that. But then there's the second death, which comes, you know, immediately afterwards, which is eternal death, you know, in hell, eternal torment, which is what all of us deserve because all of us have sinners. And as it says, the wages of sin of death, it's something that we've earned. And it's all men that are sinners. But the second half of that verse says, of Romans 6.23, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I love what it says here. It's a gift. It's not something we've earned. It's something that's already been paid for, and it's freely given to us. Jesus, being you know God's perfect and holy Son, you know the eternal God, came to this you know came to the earth in the flesh. You know he was fully man, fully God. He was right here. He stood amongst all of us as a human, and he lived the perfect life that we couldn't live. He was sinless. He obeyed his Father. He was pleasing to him. He performed you know many miracles. But then the best part was he paid for our sins. He, being God and not having to, came here and tasted a very cruel death. He died on the cross. He shed his blood, was buried, and then three days later he rose again. Now, of course, when he rose again, he proved that he had the power to take life back, and he proved who he was, that he was the Son of God. But when he died and he shed his blood, he took on the sins of the world. He took on the penalty that we deserved, because all of us deserve death. But he came and died for us. And he offers us the gift of everlasting life. And the gift of everlasting life, all we have to do is believe on him and believe on him alone. As it says in John you know, 14, 6, this is Jesus speaking, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man will come to the Father but by me. So there's nothing else we can you know, trust on besides Jesus. As he also said in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Now there's nothing else we can trust in besides Jesus. Not ourselves, not the Virgin Mary, or you know, any other you know, biblical you know, figure that was a human, or angel, or demon. But still... All we can trust is Jesus alone, because he paid for our sins in full. As it says in Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And all we have to do is believe. There's no other works you have to do. No, and in fact, there's none you can do, and we are not to do any other works or trust in them. And the best part of salvation, of course, is the fact that it's eternal. You're eternally secure. And nothing can take it from you. As it says in John 10, 28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So that's the good news. Jesus came here in the flesh and paid for it all. He died, he was buried, and rose again. And all we have to do is believe and trust on him alone, nothing else. And once you do that, you're saved and saved forever. So that's the invitation I give out to every single one of you guys tonight is come to Jesus and trust in him. Believe on him, and you know, never be unsure again. Have 100% total security in him, and know that you have everlasting life, as, it, as you know what was intended. So come to Jesus and live. Yeah, that's my invitation. Hmm, okay, thank you. Uh... So I hope you heed these words and you celebrate because uh, this is the gospel. The gospel is a Greek word. It means good news. If you understood this message, you should see this as good news. And the good news is that salvation, eternal life in heaven is offered to you right now as a free gift from Jesus Christ. All right, brother. Uh, Eric, uh, I'll let you say the last word here. That's really, really good news. It's important to know, guys, that as children of God, we can come boldly before the throne of God and say, Abba, Father, 
Let's do that right now. Abba Father, thank you for this great gift of salvation and these great guys who are great at giving it out to everyone. So, thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for our sins and being buried and rising again the third day. Okay, I just had to say that part, Lord, because uh, you know how much I love the death, burial, and resurrection that you went through for us and that we're all going to go through, uh, follow you through. Everything in this creation is going to follow you through that process. But on the other side, in you, we have life forever. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. All right, brothers, thank you for joining me tonight. And viewers, uh, please uh, join us nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Thank you. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.